Uh, welcome everyone to uh, day one of Securely's Student Wellness Week 2023, a series of digital events focusing on some of the most important topics surrounding student wellness and safety. Uh, I'm Adam Smith, uh, the content marketing manager here at Securely uh, and the host of this year's trio of events. Um, I'm genuinely thrilled to be here actually and um, this is such an important week for us and it's, it's something that means a lot to everyone here at Securely. Uh, and to, I'm sure, everyone here in attendance today. Um, to kick off proceedings, um, I'm joined by the president of K-12 Leadership Matters LLC and superintendent extraordinaire, Dr. Robert Avosa. Uh, we'll be leading our conversation today all about creating a culture that supports D, E, I, and B. Robert, it's amazing to have you here. Um, how are you doing today? And can you tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and what we'll be discussing today? Absolutely. And thank you uh, to the folks that securely for giving us an opportunity to bring forward a very important topic, one that's near and dear to my heart. As a naturalized American citizen and person who came to this country who spoke very little to no English in the mid-1970s, I, I learned firsthand that uh, belonging uh, and being part of a broader community outside of your own home and neighborhood really me makes a big difference in whether or not an individual can be successful. So for a young man to come here to the U.S., with two parents that had not graduated from high school to go on to get a doctorate degree and run the ninth largest district that can only happen with a great public education. So I spent 25 years in public education. Um, I've always worked in large urban centers in Tampa, Orlando, Florida, Charlotte, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, and then back in Palm Beach County. I served 25 years, the last eight as school superintendent. And the last several years I've been a consultant across the country. I, I serve as chief in residence at Chiefs for Change, the largest non-profit um, educational uh, advocacy group, uh, as well as running my own consultant practice. I'm excited about being here and look forward to a rich discussion about what diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging mean, and how much it differs from community to community. And that's an important component of making sure that we work on the right things, but that the context in which we work on these items really need to be taken into account. So thank you for having me here, Adam. It's our pleasure. Uh, very excited to, to hear the discussion today. Um, but we're not just joined by you, Robert. We're also joined by Natasha Speed, the Executive Director of Equitable Resource Strategy for Atlanta Public Schools. Natasha, thank you for being here as well. Uh, how are you today? And uh, how did you find yourself involved in DEI and B? Well, thanks for having me, Adam. Um, the same, excited to be here, participate in this conversation. And so uh, my way into DEIB and school districts, actually, I took a non-traditional route. So my route really started in more in health equity. My background is in public health. Um, and so I really started out really focusing on HIV specifically. Um, as a child, I lost my mother to complications of HIV, wanted to go into that field and really figure out how I could do a job of injustice, of making sure that people had the care and access that they needed to medical supplies and supports. Um, and so from there, I did disease investigation, did case management, but it wasn't enough to do it at the direct service level. What I really found was a lot of the issues and barriers were at the system level. Um, so that kind of took me on a path of really trying to figure out what that looked like. So I worked at national nonprofit level. I then later found myself into healthcare where I worked to support um, a, a wealth of different disciplines from spinal surgeons to ICU doctors, all in the name of trying to figure out how we could create better access um, and opportunities to ensure patients could get the care that they needed. Um, but with my, my passion really looking at my community, people who look like me specifically, younger kids who experience some of the barriers I experienced myself as a child. Um, that's what landed me in education. When I think about public health, I think public health and education are one and the same. Um, I focus, my personal mission really is to help improve quality of life. And I feel like education is one of the best places to do that uh, by being able to have a voice and raise the voices of those who need to be heard in this setting. So that way we can redesign the systems in order to produce the outcomes we want to see um, as opposed to what we currently see. So that's a little bit about me and how I found my way into this, into this work here. Thank you so much. I mean, again, both of your backgrounds sort of so varied, but so interesting. And I think 
yeah, we'll create an incredible sort of uh, conversation today. Before we do get to that conversation, though, um, I just want to thank everybody else who's here, our brilliant audi audience, uh, for being part of Student Wellness Week and today's session. Um, we do have a question uh, box on the side of, of your window. Uh, please feel free to use that as this session goes along. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We've also got some interactive polls coming up. So, uh, yeah, do get involved in those. We'd like to we hear what your views on these to this topic is today. Um, we'll do our best to respond to as many of those questions as we can uh, in our follow-up breakout session. That'll be taking place immediately after this session, uh, and it'll be a chance for you to chat with our speakers, uh, as well as some of Securely's product experts. They'll be there to offer a hand and some advice uh, around student wellness solutions and that kind of thing as well. Uh, that link for that, for that breakout session will be shared towards the end of this session. So if you would like to come along, um, feel free to. Um, and if you can't make it, but you still want to ask a question, all of this and all of the breakout session will be available on demand very soon after Student Wellness Week wraps up. Right, that is enough housekeeping from me. I'm going to hand it over to you, Robert. Uh, Natasha, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so, Natasha, I know, given the fact that I spend most of my time on the road working in school districts, in fact, today, I'm in Houston, Texas. I call South Florida home, but I'm in Houston um, today, tomorrow, and then Dallas uh, Independent School District the remainder of the week. I see firsthand where school systems across the country are grappling with diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, which I love that word. I also wanted to point out something that you had talked about briefly around this issue of dignity, and we'll get into that a little bit a little bit later, but. You know, what I've seen, and I'd love to get your reaction on it, is that each of the communities I work in have a slightly different sort of take on how they want to get after DEI uh, and, and B. And, um, and that's good. I think the context in which this work occurs is so critical. Each community has to decide what it is that success looks like and how we can help our children reach their absolute full uh, potential. Uh, I, like I said, I spent most of my career working in urban centers. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the success I had uh, in Charlotte, in Fulton County, and, and then in Palm Beach. But in general, how do you react to this notion that some of the definitions, we could put 100 people in a room, and it'd probably take a while for us to wordsmith what it means to us as, uh, as individual communities. Can you react to that? Yeah, I think that that's the essence of the work. Um, and I appreciate you sharing about the context and seeing that it looks very different across the nation. And it should, because when we think about each community and their lived experiences and how those lived experiences show up in the school system um, and how those systems have been structured, it's unique to each community, each family, uh, and at the particular time periods that they're going through the school district as well. So when I think about DEI and B in the context of APS, um, we've worked to tackle it in a few different ways um, because I think there is no necessarily one size fits all. And I think the components are so nuanced that it requires for our office to be structured in a way that we can um, have different avenues and vehicles to be able to see that DEIB through. So like, for instance, we have an ombuds office. They're available to be able to ensure that they can handle any incoming equity related concerns. So whether it's students, families, employees, if they've experienced any equity related challenges on an interpersonal level, they can go through our office of the ombuds. Very um, neutral, also confidential, supports them in self-advocacy. But then with my office, I work in equitable resource strategy. And with this office, we really focus on um, decision making and how we support leaders in thinking through how their decisions can be leveraged in a way to produce more equitable outcomes, right? How can we allocate our resources and utilize our resources um, and, and uh fine-tune and redesign our decision-making processes so that way we can be intentional about embedding equity-related considerations in that decision-making process. We also have our federal programs that really focuses on our federal dollars that come in to ensure that those are allocated properly, uh, as well as our equitable learning environments team. So that team's really more dedicated to the schools. Um, so how are they being able to support building leaders and what does that support inside of the school looks like? Mm -hmm. So I think that 
which you've shared about seeing it look very different across communities. I think we've experienced that here, even within APS, we talk about the communities we serve because mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're very broad and we have to be able to take into account the feedback from each of our different communities that we serve and how are the decisions we make actually impact their experiences with the school district. Yeah, and you know, resources are a big part of that. I am a huge fan of systems level work. So as a young teacher, I remember being able to impact my students and feeling really good about the progress we made or I felt like I can make a lot of decisions. As a school principal, again, looking at trends within that building, but at the central office, particularly for any of the folks who are working in positions like yours or my former job, you got to be looking at things from a systems level standpoint. Yes. So digging through that data and trying to figure out where those gaps exist and then looking at the resources we have and saying, okay, how can we shift those? I will also tell you that this notion of equity and trying to improve outcomes is not just an issue of race. So I'll give you an example. Um, there are parts of our school system that I worked in that were incredibly rural, white, and poor. And the access that those students had to high quality teachers dramatically differed than the wealthier, more suburban parts of the community that I serve. So when we think about equity, I know in this polarized world, and we'll talk politics, whether we want to or not, it's part of the work, the world that we live in, in public education in America, um, is that people are unfortunately driven into this social discussion about, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and immediately feel like, you know, they're being put upon in some way, that my kid's getting less or more. Um, talk a little bit about how you all are thinking about getting after these things, but not making it a lightning rod issue, where individuals are, you know, angry, upset, coming to the school board meetings, writing <laughs> that, you know, the things that I'm seeing all across the country right now. Well, I wish we had a fix for that. Uh, <laughs> we, we still see and experience that here, um, but rightfully so. I think, you know, when thinking about equity, especially in education, a big piece of that is you are um, making decisions that impact folks' children, their money, their core values and belief systems. And when you talk about race and race relations in this country, that gets at the core of um, beliefs that individuals were, you know, brought up and raised with and or at some point found their own new ideals related to it. And we talk about belief systems and mindsets. Um, I think that's always a tricky area and it's always going to be, create tension points. It's always going to create controversy. I think I literally just was on a conversation uh, about 30 minutes before this and it was about politics. And a big piece of that conversation was about when the community comes and the conversation around race and um, what is the stance from our district. And we have a very robust and bold policy on equity for our school district. And, but we also recognize that as we work to fit that policy into the existing structures that we currently see today, it takes time. And I think when you talk about that system level work, that's a lot of the work that I support yeah. here. I support district leaders all across um, the district who's making very large scale decisions about how do we address overcrowded schools? How do we address um, student one-to-one -one devices? How do we address being able to increase meal participation and food quality, especially whenever we recognize that we have certain schools that may be located in food deserts? And um, race constantly comes up in a piece of that. But to your point, and, it, and rightfully so, and I think another piece to that is being able to lean into how do we address the systems and structures again. And so for me, it's mindset, it's systems. I think one thing we have to be very honest about is the public education system, the way that it was initially established, it is designed to produce the outcomes we see today. Right. So when we see those disparities, um, I think a big piece of that is acknowledging that we have to be intentional about redesigning and restructuring those systems. Mm -hmm. um, absent doing that, we are continuing to do business as normal, hoping to address it at an interpersonal level. Sometimes it's in the way of like an implicit bias training, which no slight to that, it's very important. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there's beyond the, beyond the interpersonal level, there's that systems level that um, we have to redesign and reimagine 
what the system needs to look like and how it should operate so we can get to the desirable outcomes that we need to see for all students. And that's, I'm, I'm really big on that. Uh, well, I applaud APS, Atlanta Public Schools, for investing um, a great resource in you, uh, embedded in this notion that part of that is resource allocation and resource strategy, right? The point is we want every child to reach their absolute full potential. And for some, equity means they should get a little bit more. They've started further behind. There are issues that exist. They might need more time. They might need summer programming, before and after school support. There might be some other social emotional learning that needs to be embedded within certain communities um, that are grappling with issues. But I'll be honest with you in this sort of COVID, I don't want to say post COVID world because we're still struggling with a lot of its ramifications. I'm starting to see, you know, lots of issues around mental health and wellness yes. across the board and not just in communities that have been uh, traditionally impoverished. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. I did want to make one sort of comment on this notion of zoning and rezoning when schools are full and not. I'll show my age, but uh, the last time the NAEP scores, and I can't be absolutely sure that this is the exact year, but the last time the NAEP score had the narrowest gaps between African-American, white, and Latino was around the late 1980s. It was actually, I, I went to high school from 85 to 89, and I remember my high school experience it was lovely. About a third of the kids were black. About 40 to 50 percent of the students were white. The remainder were Latino and a small portion of um, of Asian Americans. And I think about this rich experience that I have as, as a kid. And then I think about my experience running Fulton County Schools in Atlanta, Georgia, which is not Atlanta Public Schools. It's the county mm -hmm. system around it. And my schools were, on average, mostly African American. Um, in south part of town, and then mostly Caucasian in the absolute north part of town. So our, even our kids' experiences in K-12 have dramatically changed over the last um, 30 years or so. We had peaked around the late 1980s, and these schools have become more segregated. And I wonder how that, how that plays out in a child's experience in life growing up with friends that don't look like them, going to church with others and playing sports with others and, and not seeing that as much. And I, I also know that the politics that come into neighborhoods, quote unquote, protecting you know, their space and wanting to peel off and start their own school systems, it's a complicated place. There's no easy answer. So I do, again, want to go back and give credit to the Atlanta public school system for investing in this position and this work that you do. I'm sorry for the, the, the little tangent, but I do believe that if we start with our kids and making good decisions early, early on, we're teaching the next generation to work together and to be honest uh, and to be care, to care for one another uh, and making sure that everybody has a place that they feel like they belong and that they have dignity no matter who they are, what they are and how they present themselves. I, I really appreciate that insight. And I think, so A, um, I agree. Shout out to Atlanta Public Schools. I've now been with the district um, going on four years. Um, but even prior to my work here, I think the district has really aimed to try to figure out how to address inequities that we see across the district. A lot of that started even with um, our student success funding formula. So that way we could try to figure out how we allocate resources um, based on student need, right? Um, and then we had the Community Equity Advisory Council who supported the board in drafting the very robust and bold policy. Um, and then we had Dr. Herring come in who really pushed a charge for uh, equity and it, making it into our goal, goals and guardrails. And of course, my chief and leader, Dr. Tahita Baker-Jones. Um, and so I think that the district has really worked to prioritize and acknowledge that we want to figure out how to create more equitable outcomes um, and experiences for our students. When you talk about that belonging piece, I think one piece that I'm seeing that we're working to be that much more intentional about right now is um, getting student voice into decision making. Totally. Right? <laughs> um, so when you talk about like the experiences of students 
um, in everyday settings. Right now I have uh, two interns who are supporting work uh, for some of our large equity impact assessments that we're doing. And I'm leveraging their expertise to say, like, how can we do a better job to actually get student voice involved? Um, and not even just student voice. Uh, through our equity impact assessments, we also really encourage leaders to prioritize identifying which voices have not been included and then trying to figure out how they can get out, engage and have deeper conversations with the voices that are often missing and left unheard. Um, how do we create and prioritize those voices? To your point about political and politics, um, I think we see the same within Atlanta public schools. There's a divide between the North and the South, and it's very clear. We see it in almost everything we do, not even just within APS context, but also at the city level. Um, right now, we're doing a partnership with the mayor's office to and the other civic agencies to figure out how we can co-design a cross-sector index to look at uh, the lived experience of community members to understand what the neighborhood level experience is. Within APS, we have a focus on whole child. And I always say that that whole child comes from a whole community. And so there are so many environmental factors that are at play, regardless of which side of 20 you live on. Um, but in understanding what those lived experiences are in the community and how they shape how students show up at school. And that's important too, again, to get the student's voice involved in decision-making. So prime example, with one of the large scale efforts I'm supporting now around school nutrition, um, being able to increase meal participation, um, ensuring that the students' voices are incorporated in that. So uh, we are some of our district leaders who is leading that work. They went and had a visit with our student advisory council to get feedback from them to say, like, you know, where are we missing the mark? What can we do better? Um, even right now with the rezoning options that are coming up for play, trying to figure out, like, how can we do a better job of getting because this is impacting the students. And oftentimes there are people who are making decisions that may not have that same lived experience. And without having that present and top of mind, um, we often can rush and make haste decisions and or just decisions absent of that in mind. And that sometimes those are the things, the very things that produce and exacerbate inequities. And so like with our equity impact assessment process, we kind of boil it down to a key set of factors. Like, have we had a chance to clearly articulate the problem we're trying to solve? Have we had a chance to think through the root cause? Are we addressing a symptom or a root cause? What data do we have? Have we had a chance to disaggregate it to understand how this is impacting different uh, subpopulations and communities? And then how are we being able to think about who's going to benefit and whose burdens? And I have to give a shout out to Minneapolis Public Schools and Chicago Public Schools, also Oregon. Um, those are some of the, the leaders in that space that we look to whenever we developed our equity impact assessment. And it's been a tool that we've really been able to ground um, a lot of the decision making that's happening right now in the Atlanta Public Schools and yeah, when you start with a vision, a set of core beliefs and values, and you can live that out, then magic happens, right? The problem is we come up with these policies, they look good, they sound good, but when it comes to actually executing on them, do we have the political courage to, to think more than just inputs, right? And it's important, the input's important, right? The investments are important. The outcomes are even more important. Really what we want to do is make sure every third grader finishes third grade reading on grade level across this country. And if they're reading on grade level by third grade, we know statistically they're going to have a much better life and a better life earning and a, an, an opportunity to turn the corner yes. uh, and get their families and, and those who come after them out of poverty. We see that time and time again. Um, it's so much more than that. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, I did not do a great job as a school superintendent on student voice. Um, I, I'm seeing more and more of the clients I work with, whether it's Providence, Rhode Island, Norwalk, Connecticut, you know, Anchorage, Alaska, they, they pull kids together. They ask them, you know, much like you're asked when you go and participate somewhere, they say, hey, how did we do? Yeah. I never, I never asked kids that. I used to ask them as a high school principal, I care deeply about that, but um, I will say that student voice is incredibly important. Your superintendent has said that time and time again. I've heard Dr. Herring say that, you know what? I'm not gonna make that decision without talking with some students and seeing how, how that might play out with them. And so that, that issue of voice and making sure it's 
it's not always like the gifted and talented and the elected student body presidents. You really need to have a, a, a cross section of voices that share what, what their experience looks like um, and, and not limit it to just the kids that have the, you know, the proper channels and authority to do so. Yeah, I think something that, to your point with with Dr. Herring giving that charge, we've really worked to try to lean into that space. Um, so uh, within our office, we have a, also have an equity strategy team, and they recently led some work around what we call an AMP Up APS. And so it's really a way to kind of amplify student, family, staff voices. Um, and so that was a charge so that way we can have a better understanding of students' experience and belonging. Um, same thing for parents. When they show up to schools, they experience that sense of belonging. And so that's a survey that actually just completed recently. And they're now unpacking the results of that data. So that way, decision school leaders and or district leaders and or family members can have that data available to be able to see how we're faring as it relates to creating that culture of inclusion, the culture of belonging, because at its very core, when we talk about equity, the diversity, the inclusion, the belonging, those are all the key components. That's like the ingredients to producing those equitable outcomes. Right. Um, and so having a better understanding of what those experiences are, I think, allows for us to then shape interventions. And so we have a lot of work to do um, as a division, mm -hmm. as a district, um, but I'm excited about being able to partner with um, my colleagues across the district. That's one thing that I think is also important to note. Um, the Center for Equity and Social Justice is new for Atlanta Public Schools. However, um, you have had people here that's been very committed to trying to produce and advance equitable outcomes for a long time coming. I think now what we're aiming to do is trying to figure out how do we do it in a um, systemic way, right? Like how do we create the structures, the infrastructure? How do we embed it and incorporate it into existing policies and protocols and processes? Um, how do we slow down the conversation so we can pause and think um, and this reflect? Is the truth. Pause. <laughs> So, I, think. I mean, I talk to educators all the time and they feel like they're running 100 miles an hour. We don't build in time. We don't stop and say, you know, are yeah. the practices we have in place getting the desired results? If not, why? And then what do we need to get that done? Yeah. Um, and I'm not seeing that time built in because we're still stuck in this agrarian model where we think we need to squeeze in nine months of schooling. And, and not find ways naturally to stop and think about the work we've done and then make changes. Absolutely. And with the conversation around time, um, being able to ensure that when we talk about seeing the inequities play out over and over again, um, oftentimes I feel that it's because we have to rush and make decisions. And I think it's and maybe you can speak more to this because of your work across the nation and seeing across all school districts. But I know for Atlanta public schools, and I don't think we're unique in this, but there's even as planful as we can be, there's a lot of things that can be reactionary in nature due to the political charge, you know, that yeah. we experience due to just even the urgency and understanding that our students deserve better. And sometimes the, those things can kind of, uh, speed us up to a place that we haven't had a chance to pause. And that's the work that we're trying to do with these equity impact assessments and making, um, being more intentional about making equitable resources, tools, considerations into decision-making processes to say, hey, do we have a chance to hear from this group? Do we have a chance to even look at data? Do we have a chance to think through the root cause of this? Are we addressing the symptom? Are we addressing the root uh, because sometimes when we haven't had a chance to have those conversations and pause in a meaningful way to have them, we show up and even with the best intentions, um, sometimes can perpetuate what we've seen in the system just because we haven't had that time. I pause. also think we've gotten so busy and so stuck and polarized that we don't give each other grace. Like, yeah. I, I want to get, you know, get into this conversation. I want to have a deep conversation I also want to make sure I don't offend anybody mm -hmm. that I don't. And so I always tell people, please understand I'm coming from a good place. If I say anything that offends an individual, please understand that that's not my intention. 
um, I'm, I'm new in this space, right? I'm a person who wants to do what's right for people, all people. And there are things that, you know, come up from time to time that one might find offensive. But if we come to the table and offer one another grace and understand that we're coming from a good place, I think good things can happen. I, I want to go back to this thing about sort of people and hiring practices. Mm-hmm. You know, I see this over and over again. Atlanta uh, in Fulton County, I had a not as difficult time recruiting and retaining people that looked like the students that we served. 40% of our students at the time I was superintendent were African-American. And though we weren't perfect at it, I felt like the number of people I could recruit um, that looked like my kids was much higher than when I moved to Palm Beach County, which about 25% of my students were African-American, but a significantly lower proportion of those teachers were. And so, you know, when we started putting a focus on that, I had individuals say, why does that matter? And so part of your responsibility as a leader is to show them, well, what the research says is that if an individual, a young boy, for example, who is it happens to be African-American and has a male teacher between third and fifth grade, the research says that, you know, the possibility of them reaching, uh, you know, their full potential graduating from high school or going to college goes up X percentage. Mm-hmm. So our job as leaders, not just to make those decisions, but to help people understand the thinking behind our action. This is not just because we need to fill out a quota. This isn't because it feels good to hire teachers that look like kids. The research clearly states that. And so you have to make your case for change. Yeah. And I think that's the hardest part in these public spaces where we're, we're having to talk with individuals and, 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 and send communication out at a level that, that makes sense to people and we're not using educational jargon, which we often do, uh, that makes people feel like they don't really understand what we're talking about. I wholeheartedly agree with that. One of my favorite quotes is um, by Toni Morrison. She says that the very serious function of racism is a distraction. It keeps you from doing your work and having to constantly prove and explain why you're doing what you're doing. Right. And um, so I think that, What we see with Atlanta Public Schools is very similar to what your experience was in Fulton. Um, We, by and large, have representation across the board in the classrooms and leadership at the school levels and even at the district level that um, is representative of our student body. I think we are in the place where uh, because we have the representation and the diversity there, we also now have to be able to take it to the next level to identify um, how do we continue to increase quality and effective teachers and leaders uh, across all schools, as well as um, have ensuring that the proper supports are there from the system level. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when we first opened, we conducted an audit uh, and 92% of the participants from the focus group shared that they felt that at some point they experienced low expectations in school district. And so like, even when we talk about mindset, I think that representation piece is very important. I think Atlanta Public Schools is in a unique position that we have the representation um, and we still see the disparities. And so we're having to lean into other areas to say, okay, now how do we ensure that that representation is um, of high quality and effective, yeah. how do we ensure that expectations are high across the board, regardless of what school setting you attend? How do we ensure that the system level is being able to support the school level needs? I think there's a lot of pressure constantly put on building leaders um, for them to have to um, be accountable for the outcomes within the schools. And rightfully so, I think we all have to be accountable. But I think there's also the piece that has to feed back into it. What is the system doing to be accountable to the school and building leaders to ensure that we're providing the proper supports that to your point earlier, when you talked about recognizing mental health across the board as an issue, like how are we leaning into that space to be able to ensure that when we recognize a pattern and a trend, you know, building leaders aren't left alone. And so I think it's a combination of all of those pieces that really allow the system to tick and to restructure and and uh, redesign what this looks like. Well, that's all about continuous improvement, right? That's what 
you know, here's a 30 day sprint. Now let's stop and look at the work we've done, what adjustments need to be made and let's hit another 30 day sprint. Um, I agree with that. You know, I, I want to stop for a moment at this mental health space. I have never in 30 years in being in public education, 25 as, an, as a practitioner, now five outside of that, still working in ed, seen so much suicide ideation, so many attempts on suicide, so many kids looking at drug and alcohol as an escape, kids now turning back to gangs. I remember we had a period where gang participation started going down. And, you know, one thing that just dawned on me as I was preparing for this was that why is it that gangs are successful? Why is it that gangs can recruit children, even though the children know what the gangs are doing are wrong? It's because they provide them belonging mm. for a minute. So here we are, we're talking about, you know, DEI and B. And what a lot of gangs do is give kids a place to feel like they belong. So if you're not the athlete, if you're not the cheerleader, if you're not the theater kid, if you're not the academic, if you're not the traditional things we see in the American public school, yeah. where are you? Right? I mean, we've seen school shootings across this country Absolutely. skyrocket. We've seen children. I've never seen so many kindergartners coming to school absolutely just not prepared for school. Yeah. COVID had a huge impact on that. I get that. But we can't keep using that as an excuse. It we've got been there before. No, we've been there before. It's gotten a little bit worse. But I worry about the safety of our children, physical safety as well, yeah. not just the, um, you know, are they behaving and sitting nicely in classrooms and are teachers bringing up the rigor so that we're not just worried about you walking across the graduation line, but are you going to go to technical college? Are you going to get an AA degree or bachelor's degree? Let's not yeah. just say you're, you know, you're a military kid. No, yeah, Let's have to decide. That that's something that I I hold near and dear to my heart because a, a big piece. I keep talking about this redesign piece, and I think that that is like to your point, continuous improvement at its core, also innovation. Um, we have an innovation office here in Atlanta Public Schools. We also have a strategy and engagement team that we work really closely with, because oftentimes. We have to rethink how we approach the conversations with these students, even the way that we do schooling today. You know, I think everyone has seen the pictures of almost every industry over time transform over the past 50 years. And then they show the pictures of the classroom and it looks almost, you know, very similar with the exception of maybe new computers and <laughs> first century feel. But and so no slight to that either. But I think to your point, when we know that we have our students showing up with the mental pressures, with the social pressures, um, also our students experiencing things that we've never had to experience, many of us from our adult life, like with the social media aspects. And, you know, then, like you say, compound with, uh, compounded with uh, COVID and then all the existing pressures that exist, we have to figure out um how we do that. But I think the way that we do that is by creating space and time to have those conversations and to be intentional. And there's so many competing priorities. I think that that's a big thing I've learned with being in education. I've worked in, again, local government, federal government, national nonprofits, healthcare. I think education by far is um, one of the most pressurized systems <laughs> that I've operated in. Mm -hmm. And again, in, in the often cases, rightfully so, because our students require and they deserve the urgency. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes urgency does not always speak to act now. Sometimes urgency means think now, like sit down, let's think about how we can pause, be intentional and design what we really want to plan for and the outcomes we want to see. Absent that, we're going to continue to perpetuate um, those outcomes. Yeah. I um, recently visited with the former superintendent in Dallas, Michael, Dr. Michael Hinojosa. And he was, I asked him, I said, you know, what are you most proud of? You were superintendent there about 11 or 12 years, two separate uh, tenures, but combined. And he told me, and he could rat off these numbers, and I was just so excited. He said, you know, seven, eight years ago, I was happy when my graduation rate was going up. And he goes, I realized that just wasn't enough, that I wanted to be able to show our kids, and again, mostly poor and, and Latino and African-American kids in Dallas. And um, I want to show them that college is not just for a certain group. And so 
he started this whole, I'll call it middle college, where, you know, kids were getting both high school and college credit. And before you know it, hundreds and then thousands of students are graduating high school with an AA degree, mm. or a certification or an AS degree where they're changing their entire life trajectory. And it wouldn't have happened if one person hadn't said at the top, that's where we're headed. So for those of you who joined us today, I just, I hope that you have the courage to think about what your North Star is, to think about the kids that we serve and don't get caught necessarily in the urgency of the moment, um, which you do need to deal with. I get it. But there's also the urgency of the future and setting the stage. So Natasha, I could not have picked a better person to participate with me. Um, you bring a, a wealth of experience in different sectors. And that's one of the reasons why I thought you'd be a perfect match for our discussion. And you did not disappoint, my friend. Thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Evans. I really enjoyed this conversation. I have much respect for the work that you've done um, locally and nationally. And so just excited to be able to continue this conversation. And I appreciate Securely for creating the platform because I think these conversations are the things that allow us to continue the ripples. Um, so that way we can continue to, to push that momentum forward in all places and spaces. Thank you. I mean, by, I, to both of you, just huge thanks uh, from everyone here at Securely and I'm sure everyone in attendance as well. Um, so insightful, so engaging, such sort of interesting uh, examples and things. Just just before we do wrap up, um, you, made, you made a comment before about um, tapping into student voice and we've had a, we've had a question about this as well. Um, and I thought I'd just ask you both, putting you on the spot here a little bit, but um, if you could give everyone here just sort of, you know, one success story or piece of advice or something that you think has made sort of the, the, bit, the biggest or most significant change for you um, within within schools to kind of create these communities or to to begin along that path at least you know what what would you what would you say is your number one sort of hint or tip well for me i'll i'll sh i'll go first and natasha while you you think about how that plays out there but for me you know i learned very early on as a high school principal and again i i admittedly didn't do it as much as superintendent I came up with this notion that every child needed a caring and loving adult on the campus. And I, I was a former soccer player and coach. And I remember just how hard high school was for me, but I had a team. I played on a team. Those were my guys. They were my friends. They didn't judge me. I fit in there. And I, I started this program in, in, at Olympia High School in Orlando where every child needed to participate in some club or activity. You guys, you'd be shocked at what the kids came up with. There were kids who loved juggling. I had nine kids in a juggling club. There were girls who wanted to do a step program. There were kids who wanted to do a walking club, a reading club. I told them, I didn't care what the clubs were. You need five kids and a caring adult. And every two weeks, we set off and allowed these kids to participate. Now, I did a lot of that instinctually as a young leader. I didn't have the research to back it, but I saw firsthand that I saw relationships being built. See, in elementary school, the teachers know the kids. They know them well because they spend all day with them. At high school, you may have six teachers. You see them each 45 minutes a day, and it's hurry up and move and move. There was no relationships really being built. Um, and so that student voice for me as a practitioner mattered, and I saw it play out that way. And so for me, I think I have two examples. One is, I think, just a broader APS effort. As you shared, this is, you know, Dr. Heron has really given that charge to incorporate student voice. And so with that charge, um, our central office leaders have really taken shape to trying to figure out what that looks like. So we have these meetings where we bring district leaders together and we meet about every quarter to um, think about, talk through you know, the current state of our district. We've actually been leveraging those meetings now to incorporate student voice. So at our last session back in October, we actually had empathy interviews. They brought in students from all across the district. We had two to three at each table. We had a chance to interview them. Um, and just hear firsthand from the students. They're now taking that another step up. Um, and so coming up very soon, uh, within the next week or so, we're actually going to go out to the schools. And because that's a disconnect that, that we've heard from building leaders is that they want more presence from central office leaders in the schools. 
So um, we're, you know, trying to make sure that we, you know, acknowledge that void and going out. But then also in that time in the schools, we'll have a chance to conduct larger empathy interviews with larger focus groups of students. So I think at a district level, that's something I'm really excited to see play out, not just the charge, but also the action behind it. I think in our equity impact assessments and some of the decision making processes we've done, um, seeing that leaders are like, already trying to figure out, okay, oh, I need to make sure I get student voice involved in this conversation. So for example, with that nutrition feasibility study, uh, sharing that with one of the leads and saying, hey, how can you incorporate student voice before I knew it within the next week? They had already developed a survey. They had already took it upon themselves to schedule time with our student advisory council. They went out and engaged with them. So I think sometimes it's just the notion that making sure we call it out and acknowledge it. And we recognize that we have leaders in the district that will show up and meet that charge. So those are, I think, two examples that I can share. Everyone, have a fantastic day. Thank you both again. I uh, hope we can uh, have another chat like this again very soon. Thank awesome. You. Thank you.